What if I told you that most traffic signals make you wait longer than necessary when changing from one signal phase to the next, simply due to lazy design? Then you'd probably ask me to tell you something you don't know. Okay, fair enough. But what if I told you that there's one country which has actually addressed this limitation in its national traffic signal guidance? Well, if you're at all familiar with road traffic innovations, then you will not at all be surprised to hear that that country is the Netherlands. When I started getting to know Dutch traffic signals, I noticed some surprising behaviors as they changed from one traffic signal phase to the next. Sometimes one green light would start a fraction of a second later than another green light on the same approach. Sometimes the next direction would get a green light while there is still other traffic in the intersection. And sometimes the next light would turn green as soon as the previous light turned red without any all-way red clearance in between. At a first glance, it might seem that the Netherlands is playing fast and loose with its clearance times between phases and using a smaller margin of error than we're used to in North America. But that's simply not the case. What's actually happening is that the Dutch red clearance time calculations are taking a more detailed look at the traffic conflicts in order to reduce the red clearance time without reducing safety. To see how this is possible, I'm going to compare the clearance time calculations from the CROV Handbook Verkeerslichtregelingen with those from the Ontario Traffic Manual, Book 12. I chose the Ontario Traffic Manual because it's the book I'm the most familiar with, but the methods in other North American jurisdictions are generally pretty similar to those in Ontario. According to both books, the transition from one green light to the next is made up of two intervals. First, the yellow warning interval gives an approaching vehicle enough time to reach the stop line if it's too close to comfortably stop. Then, the red clearance interval gives the vehicle enough time to travel through the intersection if it entered the intersection right at the end of the yellow. The calculation for yellow warning time is pretty much identical between Ontario and the Netherlands, so it's not really anything to compare there. The differences are all in the red clearance interval. The basic formula for the red clearance time is the same in both books. It's just based on a car traveling straight through at the speed limit, or a car turning at a realistic speed. But there are two key features of the Dutch method which makes it far more precise than the Ontarian method. And these are the conflict area approach and the concept of entry time. I'll start by explaining the conflict area approach. In Ontario, the clearance time for a particular signal phase is simply the amount of time it takes a car to get from the stop line to the point where it's fully outside the intersection. If it takes 2.7 seconds for a car to cross the intersection, then the clearance time is 2.7 seconds. That's it. There's one clearance time for each phase. But that method misses the fact that some parts of the intersection will become clear sooner than others. In this example with a one-way road heading eastbound, the traffic heading southbound can safely start moving earlier than the traffic heading northbound. But the Ontario calculations completely ignore this fact, and both of those phases need to wait for the same amount of time before they get a green light. In the Netherlands, the calculations do consider the geometry of the particular movements which are starting and ending. So instead of calculating one clearance time for each phase, based on the amount of time it needs to clear the entire intersection, they calculate a separate clearance time for each pair of conflicting movements based on clearing the area where those two movements overlap, which is known as the conflict area. With the conflict area approach, instead of a list of clearance time, there's now a table of clearance times where the vertical axis has the phase which is ending and the horizontal axis has the phase which is about to begin. For example, you can see here that the clearance time from the eastbound phase to the northbound phase is 2.2 seconds. There are also a lot of blank cells in the table because many pairs of phases don't conflict with each other. For example, the northbound phase doesn't have a clearance time relative to the southbound phase because they can have a green light at the same time. Here's a video clip where you can see the conflict area approach in real life. The previous phase was a left turn movement which was crossing from left to right in our perspective. So the green light for straight through traffic starts a fraction of a second earlier than the green light for right-turning traffic, since it becomes clear a fraction of a second earlier. The other main feature which Dutch calculations add 
is the concept of entry time. Everything we've talked about so far falls under the concept of exit time, which is to say the time that the previous traffic needs to exit the conflict area. But once the car has exited that area, it might still take some time for the vehicles in the next phase to actually get to that area, depending on how far back the stop line is. That time is known as the Opreitheit in Dutch, which I'll call the entry time in English. In the Netherlands, the clearance time is calculated as the exit time for the previous phase minus the entry time for the next phase. And some of you may have noticed something odd about this formula, which is that if the entry time is larger than the exit time, you can actually end up with a negative clearance time. Usually when this happens, it just gets set to 0.0, .0 instead. But some road authorities do actually allow negative clearance times. And that means that the green light for the starting phase would start while the previous phase is still yellow. To see how entry time looks in real life, take a look at the situation on the Kreutersweg in Delft. There's still a car in the intersection when the straight through traffic gets a green light. You might think that this driver has run a red light, but they actually didn't. It's just that the clearance time between these two phases is zero. So the light for that driver turned red at the exact same moment that the light turns green in the direction we're facing. Which, if we rewind a second, was precisely at this moment. As you can see, the car had already entered the intersection before their light turned red. The traffic signals allow this situation to happen because that car is so far away from the traffic whose green light is just starting. By the time the starting traffic actually gets to that side of the intersection, that car is long gone. It's worth noting that if the same phases were in the opposite order, there would be a positive clearance time, because the time it takes the eastbound cars to clear the conflict area would be longer than the time it takes the northbound cars to reach the conflict area. These two features of Dutch clearance time calculations have a massive effect on the amount of time which is lost while changing from one signal phase to another. At this intersection in Vaughan, Ontario, if you were to apply the Dutch method for calculating clearance times on a signal timing with lagging left turns, none of the critical phases would need any clearance time at all. Because each time the signal phases change, the time it takes traffic to reach the conflict area is always longer than the time it takes the previous traffic to leave that conflict area. Meanwhile, if you were to apply the calculations from the Ontario Traffic Manual, you'd end up with 24.6 seconds of clearance time per cycle, which is absolutely insane when you consider that a typical traffic signal cycle is only about 60 to 120 seconds to begin with. For the left turning signal phases, the clearance times that the formulas produce are so insane that even the manual itself tells you to just forget about them and just use a clearance time of 1.5 to 2 seconds instead. Even though in this case, the calculations produce a clearance time around 7 seconds. Since the Ontario method produces such long clearance times, every time a phase changes to another, you end up with a lot of lost time. And that creates a large incentive for traffic signal engineers to minimize the number of signal phases. This is a large part of the reason that in Ontario, drivers turning left are almost always allowed to turn across crosswalks or bicycle paths while pedestrians and cyclists are crossing. Meanwhile in the Netherlands, left turning drivers are almost always required to wait for a dedicated signal phase before they turn across those movements. This has obvious implications when it comes to the safety of vulnerable road users such as pedestrians and cyclists. Another benefit of the shorter clearance times in the Netherlands is that it enables traffic signals to react more quickly when people or vehicles are detected. This helps avoid unnecessary wait times, and that in turn also makes it more practical to use fully protected signal phases for turning vehicles. Dutch-style clearance time calculations would also make it far more practical to design intersections with crosswalks far from the center of the intersection, without ending up with ridiculous clearance times. This is important, because the standard Dutch designs for intersections involve setting crosswalks and crossrides quite far back from the center of the intersection. And those Dutch designs are starting to be used in North America. I said at the beginning of the video that Dutch clearance times are just as safe as the Ontario clearance times, even though they produce shorter values on average. And that seems really counterintuitive, because in nearly all forms of engineering, providing a bigger buffer will improve safety. For example, designing a bridge to withstand a bigger windstorm 
will indeed reduce the chance that it is damaged in a windstorm. But this principle falls apart in traffic engineering because human psychology comes into play. When you provide a bigger buffer in roadway design, drivers will compensate for that by taking bigger risks. Making a bridge stronger doesn't make the wind any stronger. But designing a road for a higher speed does increase the speed of traffic, regardless of what number you put on the speed limit signs. In the case of clearance times, if you make the red light clearance longer, more people will run the beginning of the red light. So the safest possible clearance time is not the longest clearance time, it's actually the most realistic clearance time. With the Dutch method, the clearance time does very closely match the actual amount of time that traffic needs in order to clear the next movement. So if you start getting in the habit of entering the intersection after the light turns red, someone's going to honk at you pretty soon. But in the Ontario method, you can get away with running the red light far more often, which makes it easier to develop that bad habit. And this is a problem, because although the Ontario method produces longer clearance times on average, the margin of error they provide is actually exactly the same. Going back to our example of a simple intersection, most of the conflicts do get extra clearance time in the Ontario method compared to the Dutch method. But the clearance time from the eastbound traffic to the north-south pedestrians on the east side is actually exactly the same. That pedestrian crossing is the last conflict area in the intersection, so the distance to clear that area is exactly the same as the distance to clear the entire intersection anyway. And waiting pedestrians are standing right next to the conflict area, so the entry time is zero. The end result being that the calculation is exactly the same in both the Ontario and Dutch methods for this particular conflict. I think there are huge potential safety benefits if North American jurisdictions develop more realistic methods for calculating clearance times. Partly because it would reduce red light running behavior, but mostly because it would make fully protected left turning phases so much more efficient and therefore so much more likely to be implemented. There are certainly some challenges to implementing Dutch style clearance times in Ontario, such as finding traffic signal controllers which can actually handle different clearance times for different pairs of phases and developing an entry time method which considers the fact that Ontario's traffic signals are on the far side of the intersection, thereby allowing drivers to still see the signals if they stop way too far forward. These are certainly interesting points to discuss, and I may do so in a future video. But even if a portion of the Dutch method can be brought to Ontario, I think that a new method for calculating clearance times has huge potential to improve the safety and efficiency of roadways for everyone.